Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel and today I'm going to be discussing some of the nonsense you have to learn as part of your BSc degree in mathematics. So let's begin. In order to uh, compile this uh, YouTube I had to do a little bit of research so I recently asked a question on Sci.Math in order to get some ideas of the kind of nonsense that you have to learn as part of your degree today. So the question I was asked, the question I asked was this. I'm compiling material for a new video. For this I need to get the exact mainstream view on the following. Given that equation, show how the definition works and explain what it means in terms of the implication truth table. And your name will be mentioned in my video. So <laughs> After maybe 72 comments, um, someone got a little bit close. An annoying and generally ignorant fool whose name is Jean-Pierre Massager, also known as Python, YBM, JPM, etc. And he answered as follows. <clears throat> so what you see there in the red is as close as he got. Uh, the rest were totally absurd. But he shows uh, in response to a question when can it be ever when can it ever be false and he correctly points out line two and then in this final line here he agrees that the truth table can never be uh, can never yield the result of false otherwise the first order logic statement that you see over here wouldn't work right so let's see this is the confirmation that I was searching for because, um, you know, when Weierstrass originally started looking at this, uh, at trying to rigorize uh, calculus, he actually failed, but that's besides the point. Um, he failed because all he did was he wrote down a consequence of the limit in terms of symbols and numbers, and this is how he got his ideas. He, he, he looked at the... Uh, uh, a straight line and mapped and saw that there was a mapping in this region here, this blue shaded region. Okay. And so everything that he wrote down followed from this. Uh, but he did work from Couch's original definition, which said, uh, you know, a change in X gives you a change in Y. There's no infinitesimal change. That's just nonsense. But that's where he got the idea from. And so continuing. <clears throat> He stated that the limit of this function is x approaches c is equal to l as follows. I'm not going to read that out, but it's a first order logic statement which appears to work for all functions, but it doesn't work for a horizontal straight line. Can you guess why? Well, imagine what would happen if you had to, if Varstra just started with a straight line. There wouldn't be anything to map. In other words, there's no epsilon for a straight line. Epsilon is, is, is effectively zero. This distance here is zero on a straight line, so it doesn't really work, okay? Um, and then we look at the truth table here, the implies truth table with these two inputs, and we see that it's only ever false in the second line. But row two and four don't actually happen because the value of epsilon is not even relevant in the case of a horizontal line function. Uh, so one would think that this is a big deal, but it's actually a small thing. And let's look at how this works in a dynamic applet. So we can show the epsilon delta relationships as, as that's not the one I wanted to look at. We can show the epsilon delta relationships as follows. So basically anywhere in the shaded region, the truth table must show true, right? Outside of the shaded region, it's false. It's false and it does not imply the one part of the statement does not imply the other. And this works for any function. So except the horizontal line function in which epsilon doesn't matter, right? So coming back to the uh, PowerPoint. So uh, we looked at the function f of x is equal to x. And now let's look at a constant function. So to make a constant function, what I had to do to make this work is uh, I had to I had to actually do a little adjustment in my logic. So let's make that four. 
you see, because anytime I moved, uh, I, I changed this region here of the of the shaded region, or otherwise it would be false. So uh, I did a little bit of cheating here, and I just added in a special uh, part in the first order logic statement so that it would work, and and that took care of the problem. Okay, so now. Um, we notice that it works for all functions regardless of type. In other words, it can be surjective, uh, injective. It doesn't really matter provided it's continuous and smooth. But does this rigorize the mainstream calculus? Of course not. And this is the reason it doesn't. So now some of you might think, oh, well, I've written this down wrongly. No, I haven't. Delta and epsilon are functions of each other. Um, and I'll show you how that works in a moment. But the problem here is that you have to know the value of L in this first order logic statement. And there's no way to get it unless you do a lot of kludgy things, including trying to calculate the derivative using a finite different function, dividing by zero, and doing all sorts of monkey business. Okay, so we're not going to bother about that now. And we're going to come back to this particular applet to show you how this example here works. Okay, so now... I chose this example here because I saw it listed on the website of Will Johnson <laughs> and watch how it's done in the bogus calculus. So first of all, you've got several pages where you have to learn the rules of the game. And then once you've learned the rules of the game, you've got to watch out for common mistakes. And then you've got to learn how to work with inequalities. And then you need strategies for finding delta. And finally, this here is the solution. Okay. And I'm going to show you that it's much easier to get it in using my method, okay, which is the inverse function method. And this is the whole proof of the inverse fu function method. There are no inequalities, it's systematic, it works for any function, and you don't have to learn all that extra nonsense that you do. Um, however, in the new calculus, you don't even need to know any of this because it's taken care of. The new calculus is rigorous. The bogus mainstream calculus, which you have to learn, is anything but rigorous okay so now um, we can show this graph here and we can see how this works if we uh, move the shaded region okay so you'll notice here that i've expressed both of them in terms of each other so i've expressed delta in terms of epsilon here and epsilon in terms of delta and i'll put these applets and everything else in the detail section so that you can play with them you can type in any function you like here at the bottom and and see what happens, uh, you know, to the to the shaded region. Of course, this here won't apply anymore because this here applies to this particular function. So, um, at any rate, uh, there is even a better method than Weierstrass's algebraic first order logic method, and it's actually a geometric method. So let's see how this works in an applet. Now. When I was young, I tried to find solutions to all this nonsense. I actually started teaching myself calculus at age 14. So when I got to university, I had already developed most of these uh, theorems. Now, here's a special theorem for the bogus mainstream calculus. It's a geometric theorem, and it shows you that as the point, as the delta region moves closer and closer to the point, the area of the circle disintegrates to zero. As you move further away, it goes, it gets bigger. And of course, this theorem doesn't just work for straight lines and higher order functions. It works also for a horizontal straight line. Okay, so if I type in here, f of x, oops, f of x is equal to, let's say, 2. Oh, don't know what I did there. Let me just undo that. f of x is equal to 1. Yeah, there you go. It even works for this function. So if I move that away from the red point with this interval increasing, the, the area of the circle gets bigger. If I move it there, the area of the circle gets smaller. And the statement of the theorem is this here. Okay, now, this theorem here, as you see, will work for any function you type down here. It doesn't matter what it is. You only have to prove it once. And you never have to worry about 
so here's the full statement of the theorem. You never have to worry about any epsilonics or anything else, and the proof of this theorem can be done in one page. So since this method is entirely geometric and only needs to be proved once for any continuous and smooth function, we are done. We don't have to do anything else. It even works for the horizontal line. So the mainstream calculus is flawed and you have to learn all this nonsense. Rather than wasting an entire semester learning the rot of Weistras, uh, this entire knowledge can be learned in 60 minutes and there's no time wasted with error-prone inequalities, first-order logic, and countless proofs which you will never use even in pure mathematics. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know I've tried to cram a lot of information, but I'll put all the links in the details section. This is the New Calculus Channel. I'm John Gabriel, and I hope you'll join me again at some future time. Goodbye.